yeah. I cannot make with no amount of time a better header than this. Tight. <sighs> with all of that nasty tear down, it would probably have 20 different cancers. There's some nasty crap in that motor. We are finally on the rebuild. And so I'm doing this video right. I am starting with my baby dowels. We're using a cool little trick I've been working on. I'm sure I'm far from the first person to do this, but we are going to put four dowels into it, not five. We're gonna use it in a way that takes the dowel, bolt, normal bolt, or the, in, in this case it'll be the turbo and studs, and does a little bit of, A, it lets us be a little bit sloppy with the motor, which I'm not going to be, but B, it allows us to use a very commonly available dowels from the motor. Use about eight of these to make these dowel bolts, which are really studs. That's how we're starting, and then we got some really cool things to do to this motor to make sure it survives. Billy Johnson driving the shit out of it. Sit back, relax, loosen your bra, unwind your neck, and enjoy all the pain and stress that we have to do just to build a simple two-rotor. Oh no, that's not good, we need a lot of water. That was full water pressure? That, yeah, the water's gone, it's uh, evaporated. Look at that. This will be fine, because these are only 0.2 inches in. Why did I pick those particularly? I have a lot of reason for what I did. This is a very thin motor. The NA motors are even thinner. Look at that, that is just, that just feels so good. So I picked the ones that had just enough meat that really make me sit well with the combustion process. Mind you, air starts here, compresses, that's not a big deal, and then ignites. And the ignition process can, if there was a detonation, can go out that way. So we want this one almost 100% of the time. But then remember, the power stroke continues down here. So I wanted to make sure we space these out along the combustion process, so then they go over to here. I was gonna run one of these, but A, this one has not enough meat on here, and then what if you accidentally port this too low, and now we've crossed streams, and B, this one right here on the middle iron is super thin, so we'd crack that. I was gonna do this one, I chose not to. So we have one, two, three, four, intake manifold, exhaust manifold, dowel, dowel, that's a pretty solid motor stuck together. Now we're gonna go ahead and hammer through the rest of this and get this damn thing built tonight. some major progress on such a shitty engine. <laughs> we're doing like, not overkill, but again, remember, we're scared. I wanna make sure that the rotary can just start really performing. So we're just doing everything we think will make this a solid engine for 400 horsepower sustained. So this center iron, I'm gonna have to swap out the dowel pieces I have on it because they're going to pop through in a second. Once this thing's all plugged in, this thing just, so easy. So you can see right there, that's possibly gonna be a fracture at some point. It's still solid, it's clean and on point, but you know, vibration or whatever, I, I suspect that that will be a weak point. That's why I chose one with all this material here. But you can see, same thing here, pretty close. I'm pretty happy with that one. You just don't have the same material. Now this one's, that one's great. They're all pretty solid. I don't like the idea of breaking the inside of the engine to the outside of the engine and cracking along here. So that's why I'm like hesitant to do ones like this one right here. Cause look at the center of the hole almost puts it right to the edge. So I'm 99% sure that one's gonna broke. We have a lot of weird issues that just happened to the shop. The luck just sometimes just runs out a little too soon. But there are two absolute certain things in this world. One is I will prevent that car from beating this one, and keeps will prevent my hairline from going absolutely bye-bye. <laughs> While I'm pulling my hair out, trying to make sure this car does not lose, keeps make sure I don't lose any more hair. Keeps 
focuses on preventing male pattern baldness related hair loss. Two out of every three men by the age of 35 experience some form of it. And well, looking at my brothers as a sample size, all three of us, we were going for hundred percent. We're that type of family, all or nothing. Not only just keeps focus on preventing hair loss, but you actually can grow hair back too. And in my case, I did right up in the corners here and, and a lot on my crown that was very much thinning out way too soon. There are a variety of options. Their website answers any questions that you could have. That was the sort of stuff I had to research long before Keeps was here. And my goodness, do they do a great job at preventing all of that fear, all that uncertainty, all the, the weird things on the internet that you read, you can find it all on their website. Very straightforward. If you're interested in taking 50% or more off of your first order, go to keeps.com slash Rob Dom to sign up. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash Rob Dom. We're going to unveil what this amazing thing is behind us, but just ignore that for a second. It's the first one in the country, but this is Isaiah's world. I'm just living it. From now on, every time I go over to Turbo Smart, I'm going to bring a little trick or treat bag with me because I always got to come back with the best stuff. They're the ones that give you the full size Snickers. <laughs> they have the bowl out, so you just take the whole bowl. Oh, wow. Wow, so, what is that? Look how tiny baby this thing is. So, as we're doing a badass fuel system, you need a badass fuel pressure regulator. So, look. That is small. Yeah, they don't stop. And they have like a nice little bracket for it. It just sits in there real nice. Yeah, that's clean. That's way smaller than the one that's on the three rotor. So that's gonna be our fuel pressure regulator to go along with. I actually gave Rob two options. So he, he's gonna see his two options right now and he gets to pick. Behind door one okay. is what I would like to see. Don't Rob. tell me that, because I, I want the other one. Just kidding. Ooh. This is their motorsports one. So it has a heat sink in there. Oh, this is like their IndyCar one. Yeah. Oh. So if we have the space for this, I'll like to run this one. I got another wrench. That's, <laughs> how'd you know you know me? You have all wrenches up there. Oh, I ever wanted. And this is their traditional. Same same 45 millimeter. Yeah, that, that's nice sick. Mine's not, as, mine's not as big as his, but it, they do the same thing. Just, we'll just I just want to point that out. It's, it's not about the size. <laughs> but it, uh, what TurboSmart has told me for long ago, this is basically their IndyCar one, so additional heat sinks. You will never experience the issues that this one's combating on this one. But if you were to run a car like 24 hour Le Mans and you wanted to make sure that your gate is just never, ever, ever going to get close to critical temperature, in theory, you you could run that. We're going to do the track event and the Death Valley stuff. This is going to be his most daily drivable car. So you're going to need a voice gate that never fails. Rotors mm -hmm. make a lot of heat. So, I mean, I'm just saying. It'll come down to space, really. That's exactly why I brought both. But this one's water cooled as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can water cool them. So all, all their waste gates are water cooled. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so really you wouldn't even need this if you water cooled them, which we don't need to. We don't need to water cool it. It's going to come down to space cuz uh, let's show you guys the reason for these gates. My buddy Elliot from Turbo, honestly the four wheeler would not have been impossible without him, makes this almost impossible to beat. Almost This, this is impossible to beat. Yeah. I cannot make with no amount of time a better header than this. Everyone who asks me to build an FD header, FC header, go to Turbo. This is 347. We we actually x-ray scanned it and confirmed it is 347 stainless steel. He already has two bungs for if you want to run EGTs, temperatures, and then back pressure sensor. You could do anything. And it tapers because it's not tube turning into a welded thing. It all it's just cast as a smooth runner from a circle. To yeah, he has it in noble. a CDF, doesn't he? Yeah, he has it maximized flow and everything. And then, of course, two wastegates built into this. So we are going to have the nastiest responding turbo on the car. We got a really cool thing cooking up for that with Garrett. But what you can see here is that each one has its own wastegate. So that means that each rotor is shooting its pulse pff, pff, separately to each other. So the wastegates aren't mixing, the pulses aren't mixing. So that means when it gets to the turbo blades, especially when it's a divided housing, each part is spinning different parts of the, that, so that the pulse is maximized into a very specific like velocity. It's not wide like that. That's a lot of air, but it's not moving a lot. But if you, you can move something a little bit harder and get almost a thousand, 750 RPM faster turbo response. Can you explain what the twin scrolls do in a turbo? Yeah, so like, kind of what I just said right there is that on a twin scroll turbo, imagine the compressor blade, like a little pinwheel, you know, one of those pinwheels that, and they, they spin when you like this to the pinwheel there's not enough velocity for that pinwheel to start overcoming its inertia and start spinning so what you're doing is you're basically saying hey don't spin the whole turbo blade yet spin half of the turbo blade 
and you're gonna hit it harder with faster exhaust pulses, so it will spin faster. That's for starting up. Of course, flow matters that now you're using the whole blade when you go But the point is that if you combine them before that, you actually lose that pulse. So you lose that little shock, and it just kind of bleeds out into more of a wider open volute, and you don't get the same level of response. Chris has got one more thing, he just showed up. Oh yeah. You guys know how obsessive I am about having solid voltage pulley. Oh yeah. So they got the dual pulley for the FC, and then they had this front cover for the four rotor sitting there because they were testing some things. And so they put it on this one. So we have the DC power little DOM logo, which is cool as hell, meant for an FC. So this thing's gonna kick out 14.6 volts without thinking all day long. I finally listened to them and wired these right. The car can shut off and not drain power and it properly charges. I'm gonna shoot you straight. These things are expensive, but you do not know. If you're on the fence or if you're not sure or you say, man, that's expensive, it is way cheaper than blowing your car up because you have inconsistent voltage, your coils are getting different voltages. I cannot stress that this is a me thing. This isn't paid nothing. Do not skimp on your alternator. I used like three or four reman alternators and that ended up being a contributing factor to the three rotors demise because we were chasing gremlins and we weren't focused on the real issue. When you have something like this, you know I'm seeing the right voltage, my pumps are seeing the right voltage, my coils are seeing the right voltage, and you move forward. It is so, so, so wonderful to have. Since we've been experimenting with the Rotary C5 and have found the limits of stock ports, we decided to finally take a little foray into porting the exhaust. And that does have some trade-offs, but the very first thing is, you always hear people talk about porting the exhaust up or down, and it really is physically up or down when you look at it from here. So here is a stock port on a turbo two motor. Cute little baby. And so what happens is when the rotor and the combustion occurs, it's gonna come this way. So there's a you know, hot pocket of gas producing power right here, and then it's gonna open up into the exhaust, and that's where the exhaust starts going out. The sooner, if say in theory we were to port the exhaust all the way down to here, you would only get a very small part of the power stroke before the exhaust is actually escaping. And so then you lose that torque that you were now building up. So you, you do not want to port it too far down because then you lose that nice oomph from the motor. But then the other downside is if you go, okay, well, I'm gonna go up, I would argue that's even worse because now, when the rotor goes past that and it's sweeping, it's like, hey, get the rest of the exhaust out. It's like, it really is like squeezing it out. It's also doing the intake. And so what happens is if you put this too far up, you're keeping exhaust in the rotor and it allows exhaust, especially if it's turbo, to go back in because it's pressurized and then it ends up having more overlap with the next rotor. So you're filling the rotor with more exhaust. No matter what, you will always have a little bit of exhaust in your next combustion cycle. And that's actually useful. That is actually a very important part of the process. Too much is just too much. And now you're overlapping and you're not getting enough air, fuel, you know, all the good stuff. Really don't want to port up. You want to port down, but you don't want to get too aggressive. And so this is kind of a nice little combination of both. The wider helps a lot, but now you're increasing the chance of the apex seal warping. I would argue with semi-peripheral, you're able to cool the apex seal consistently. We don't have semi-peripheral on this motor, but right now the apex seal is only riding on this corner and that corner, whereas before it had a little bit more meat more of the time. You'll see weird wear patterns as the apex seal warps, and more than likely it's going to warp with the center bowing down. I've noticed that on mine at least, that you'll see the center bowing down, you'll have even more problems with sealing. In this case, I think this is a nice little compromise. It opens up a lot sooner for us. It's gonna be higher RPM. And since it's turbocharged, it's gonna just flow more heat and high energy out to the turbo and hopefully capture it. For example, the three rotor porting was done by the company that I bought the housings from, and those are even larger. They're wider, they do go up a little bit and they go down even more. And I was afraid that they'd be horrible. And in fact, they are wonderful. We're just going to kind of open it up as we go, as we continue finding the right combination of porting for our beautiful turbocharging needs. If you follow the shape of this steel insert, mm. it is higher than the opening point here. Oh yeah, yeah. That's by design. It On the four rotor, it does actually open up a little sooner and then follows the following angle, which is a pain in the ass to CNC, to be honest. Like, Cause at first I was measuring it to be a linear thing straight across, but you don't. It's kind of a nice little observation there, but we're going to now try and match 
the other one from this engine to this one because more than anything else matching the two intakes and exhausts have to be as identical as possible that is the most critical thing in this motor Magic right there. A lot of people use the uh, dicum, which is pretty much the same thing. It's just this so you could etch and then you go exact to that line. Sharpie works just as fine. So when you pour, you never want to go where the oil control ring is. I don't know if you're able to see that like circle that follows it. So this has a curvature and that continues to go. You can see it where in there. So you never want to go past that because then you're going into your oil control ring path. Let it dry. Then slide this back over here. Put your little dial through, find your location, press down. I like to use a tungsten. So you can see we're not gonna overport this thing. This is not a lot, but it's still gonna help. And that's how much bigger we are going. Finally have everything all reamed and ported and all the other craziness that goes with this. Hey, look at that. Super clean. Yeah, there we are. We're gonna go ahead and do a quick test fit just to see how this motor fits together. We're gonna just center it because it's so much easier to see and the, each of the ends are kind of anticlimactic. So, don't want to fingers caught in there. That looks good, that's Mazda OEM, so it's not, I wasn't expecting anything crazy. There, don't mean to slam them. They're doing that to themselves. I'm super curious of is making sure everything's all lined up. Having a motor that is this trashed is actually a lot more difficult, a lot more difficult than a completely clean one. Oh, look at that though, nice and smooth. It's going right into the next piece. And then same thing with this one. Man, I, I have to be careful with how tight I make these. I'm not even in halfway through this and it's getting so tight Partially because these are kind of shitty uh, dowels. They've been ran in, these, in motors, I got them used, and I'm kind of paying the price for that. So this motor is gonna be a one install type of thing. These are all just really rough, but they're getting it. Get a little too tight with my setup like this, because look at that. It's in, it's fine, but there is no wiggle room. And I don't want this stuff to be press fit. This is too tight for me to have it be press fit. It's awesome that that seems so press fit and that's great, but that's gonna cause me some problems down the road. I'm not happy with that. This is something I am very excited to work on. I have no experience with this, but you see these little ball and spring things? These are little baby regulators actually, but what's going on here on this end is that plugs into this spot here and that sprays the inside of the rotor. This is a, just a bearing surface and it leads very gently out of the corners because it's high pressure and the high pressure is meant for the very shallow bearing surface. But this on the other hand is squirting oil into the rotor and that's where you get your cooling effect inside of the rotor. Mostly, 99% of it is from this little guy right here. The issue that I have is as I raise pressure of the system, that's cool, but I want to raise flow. I want to get cold oil or at least operating temperature oil into the rotor, absorbing the heat out of the rotor, and then dumping that down into the oil pan. You won't do that raising the pressure, you'll do that raising the flow, and that's where these start to make me question things. And so Mazda does offer six bucks, a little guy like this, and what this little guy should do, look like it flows less. Because of the, the ball and chain, the ball and spring on the back side of that, this one ends up flowing less. So this is actually the race squirter. This is a two millimeter hole, this is much larger than that. And you don't put the ball and spring in the back of this. You don't mess with that stuff. You just simply put these into the E-shaft. And so now you are going to be using more of your pressure to flow it out into the rotor and ultimately taking the heat out of that. So I'm upgrading this E-shaft to that just to see if that makes a difference. How do you measure that? You can't. That was one of my very exciting things to do. And the other one I'm gonna do it's been driving me nuts for the longest time. I make jokes about this thing. Every time we do an engine build, I always talk about this being the little monster from the Matrix movies that gets put in Keanu Reeves' belly button. We're replacing that. 
replacing that with a plug. This plug will prevent this whole assembly bypass and this is a thermal pellet and all this other crap. This can fail. I don't want that to fail. So that goes into the very center of here and it will actually plug this hole permanently. Why this hole? Well, just like the other oil bypass and relief valves, this center of this E-shaft is filled with high pressure, high flowing oil. And when this thing gets pissy, it all just dumps out of this hole directly. No filters, no bearings holding it with high pressure, a straight up hole. And so you will lose pressure in the whole E-shaft and it'll just squirt out of this. I don't want that hole going nuts, but I do want all the bearings getting high pressure and this getting high flow. So I'm doing, this is the first time I've ever actually done modifications to the E-shaft and I'm curious to see how this handles. This is our first car that we're just gonna be bouncing off the rev limiter for more than one pull. Can't leave things alone. So this is a 2.2 millimeter drill bit, 0.086 if you guys are wondering, and it does not fit in that hole. And we're going to make it fit in that hole. Okay, well, we'll know if I have low oil pressure, it's this, I, I screwed up. It's close to my birthday and this is basically like a major birthday celebration. I am cutting open my very first thing of red Loctite. That's how permanent this moment is to me. I am going to red Loctite these threads. We don't really get a chance to undo this while the engine's together. So certainly going to make sure this is good. It might've been a little too much. I do not need to know that this came out of the E-shaft at 10,000 RPM. Yeah, so we are going to do this as well. Nice little beast of a screwdriver. Do the same thing on this side. There. And that is an upgraded E-shaft. Hopefully it, it stays upgraded. These are the stock Turbo 2 bolts. They're much beefier than the NA, let me tell you that. Huge difference. but. You can't ignore going with something like this. Elliot, you may or may not watch this video, but I respect that you charged me full price because you've been so helpful all this time and you have no reason to help me with the, this turbo too. <laughs> These bolts are worth every bit of that. Like. I think I paid, what, 650 maybe less? Regardless, it doesn't matter because these are worth it to me. Such a small difference compared to all my other things, but it makes a big difference. Elliot makes this basically ARP stud kit. This is his 10 millimeter, basically OEM stud. Stud means that it's not a bolt, there's not a bolt head. It's got a nice hex head. I hate hex with a passion, but it is useful for when you have the engine all together. This goes through the motor uses the stock threading down here, just like this one would, except you have a slightly thicker bolt. And the reason I wanted to test this right now, instead of until later, is I have one hole right here that has to be done the way I did it, and the threadings, let's see if this can be painful for me. Okay, it'll, it'll be annoying. It has nothing to do with Elliot's stuff. It has everything to do with the fact that these two fit tighter together and this hole on this iron is offset. So if I'm like that, engine's going put together, it's in just fine. Okay, so that's good. Otherwise, I'm gonna have to go back to this because it's looser so you can find the center of that much easier. Look at that. That's how easy it is. Like, I, no big deal, whatever. Let's start with this. There's a couple of different companies that offer these kits and so far I've been pretty happy with most of them. They each have their like quirks. These do not have a cold side. They just are. I really like the idea of using Hylamar with reusable seals. I have some reusable seals that are covered in gasket maker, and I really truly doubt, unless I'm really screwed over at the moment, I doubt I'm ever gonna use them. A little large, but... Now this channel will still be very active because I'm not blocking it off, so I have to be careful about that. What's nice about this process is the, the flatter the motor is, I realize the less I have to get crazy with this. Look at that, everything's looking good. Everything's looking good. And it begins. I was asking Chris where the TY jelly or petroleum jelly was and he went out to his car and grabbed it. So <laughs> that was he stealing the torch. It's not the hottest in here, so that's 
good. Okay, and down we go. Feels good. Nice. Yeah. My number one rule that I always break is don't move the rotor after you set it down. Now I've already picked this up and the spring is already messed up, which means I'm going to put pressure on this rotor and then now everything's all hell's breaking loose. Let's see. Okay, there we go. That's looking good. What I'm going to do differently this time, and it could bite me in the ass yet again, is I'm going to put each seal in halfway. So it's not pressuring the rotor to move other than equally. So the bottom part doesn't screw me over and then we'll uh, kind of, like I said, we're just gonna wedge all this together. The most gratifying and least gratifying thing about rotor engines is pushing these apex seals down. For the record, I am using uh, all used springs. Okay, what do you think? I believe. That's your two. <laughs> oh, that's that's my new thing. That's my that's how I'm doing it from now on. That was flawless. Yeah, that, that worked. I will take that victory. Move on to this. This engine is the exact engine that we should be using more of this. I JB welded parts of this engine, the these housings. I knew that they were pitted, but I, I just I can't waste stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I can let the engine hurt me, but I can never hurt the engine like that. So we are going to ever so gently there. Spaces where I just want to fill in those cracks. I've JB welded and then sanded it down. This is more about the water. So in there just to stay. So it's pretty pitted, but not like the three rotor fed here. Instead of going upside down. So We are going to want to have the e-shaft in this. Probably right there. Yep, and I can see it. You're going to have to, have to spin the, the, yeah, that until we find the right angle. Don't spin the rotor or anything like that. You have to spin, uh, opposite way, 180 degrees. Keep going, keep going. There you go, a little bit, a little bit more. Okay. Let's see. Okay, we are gold. You can let go. That was actually uh, smooth. Yeah. That went, that went really smooth. I'm not like doing this for a specific reason other than actually cleaning them and the oil just, it's the first thing I have. I don't want people thinking like, oh, he's doing a special secret thing. You guys notice how it doesn't matter which shit we use, there's always somebody in the comments saying, you shouldn't use that. Just vastly, and everybody's like, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> you use Hylomar. <laughs> and then, of course, somebody else, so if you start using Hylomar, oh, yeah, you, you shouldn't use that. We were just saying off camera, Hylomar is weird. It, it never really dries, but it doesn't, it definitely becomes useless. So with that, we are ready. <laughs> I'm the same guy who buttoned a motor together without putting apex seals in the rear rotor. My favorite moment though that is the Patreon stream with the four rotor mm -hmm. where I reassembled the motor and the front lobe popped out. It was on the live stream. And it was such a gratifying proof moment that I fucked up. Because <laughs> it was like, yeah, it could. And it just bloop. Like that creepy dude that does all the cooking shows where he's just like. Okay. I'm not going to wiggle it. I'm not going to wiggle it. We're going to test my theory again on this one. Make sure that they're not bowed. Make sure that they're flat. Okay, here comes the moment. I gotta seize it. Oh, it's the little things in life. That's actually a really big thing, because that's such a pain in the ass, and they're all in. 
I think this is the first time I've ever seen it go. This, that's the first time I've had a motor have every single apex seal go in without like pulling the rotor or jiggling. Now before we start getting crazy, I have to remember to start putting all the dowels in now because once we put the last thing in, we can't put all of our other dowels in. I've made that mistake before. Okay, I am actively lubricating these. My doweling's getting a little too tight on tolerance. And so I'm expecting the worst, but the holes just look oh, it's all lined up. I do not, I expect it to hit something. <laughs> well, not, I didn't expect it to only go halfway there. The holes look to the human eye, just very squared up, wonderful. All it takes is a little edge. Okay. Now all these are gonna go in smooth once, that one, might, that one might be a pain in the ass, but these are all gonna go in smooth. Once one goes in smooth, it's shifted the block the way I want it, and then they're all ready to go. Okay, am I gonna have to cut these down? These are 115 millimeters. I have two of them in there, so that's 230 millimeters wide. The two rotor housings are 80 millimeters. The center iron is 50 millimeters, and I have five millimeters on each end of that. That comes out to 220. You need to take 10 millimeters off of these, and I almost forgot completely about that. So we're gonna do that real quick, you know, while the engine's just setting up. I ended up doing this last time when the bandsaw was broken, and I did it with an angle grinder. Sometimes. Very fun, very, very fun. <laughs> it was at 01, look at that, 105. I'm proud of that. We are back in business, that went really quick. So we already have the first sets in there. And these are gonna be suggested into place. This is always kind of scary because the motor is not assembled. It looks assembled, but everything is just gently touching each other. The tips are just gently touching. And so, you know, too much. Ooh, 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 I got interrupted by my own machining. There we go. Because I have even less vibration in my machining now, it's causing the holes to get smaller because the reamer is not vibrating. So that's why I'm so like upset that it's even better. Wow, that's not going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> we'll juice up the back side of the rear iron. And then we're, this is the home street. We can still leak oil out of that because if we did not close that down. The only thing that could be bad is because I cut all of those dowels. They aren't beveled like the stock ones are. None of those are sticking up. So this, until this is starting to fall. Oh. Look at that. Not enough I, that's the there. first time I've ever had one of those start to move. That's what you do that visual check for. Glued it down even more. The reason that matters so much is I have to suggest it. That sucks, just because I didn't bevel my dowels, so that was a pain in the ass, but it made me remember this step, which I always forget until after the fact. I'm not the best person in the world, but one of my pet peeves is seeing other people just slam these down into there. Like, it's just like, those are threads. Those are people too. <laughs> don't, don't beat the shit out of the threads. This is not something that you have to torque. You, you, these aren't going through the motor. These are just simply screwing into the front iron. That's all they're doing there. These are actually what the silicone is supposed to be doing. Oh, these are for the bottom two. We'll use normal bolts for that when we get to that. concern right now is, is just hoping that this thing holds coolant. That's all I care about right now. It's amazing how loose that 
first setting of torque really is. You're thinking like you hear it crunching and making noise. You're like, oh man, that is gone. And here I am like capable of tightening up way more by hand. I'm gonna turn it up forward and just kind of see. We should hear it clink. Yep, there we go. That was a good clinking noise. Bearing doesn't look like it's off-centered. We're not 100% ready for this yet, but I wanted to show you that comes out. This basically goes in and then this spring goes in behind it, holding that in place. There's really no reason for it ever to open, but kind of a cool little replacement. We're gonna clean this off way more though. I have professional tools, it's important to use them. And it is now stuck on there. Taper down like that. One of these would then go on. They're a lot smaller than the FD ones. At least they look smaller. Like that. I want to clean that up a little bit. Not a big deal. Put this on. Put this on. This is the other surface, so that's I just make sure that's there. Put that on. That, that, and then and then this. Put that down. Okay, so the engine spins, thankfully. Now this is my Second time using this, it's in the middle of its travel. And so we're gonna, I'm gonna push up from the bottom. Oh, I forgot to put the screws on that. <laughs> that scared the shit out of me. You see what you're actually measuring? You're actually measuring how much the E-shaft can travel up and down to this plate. That's truly, the E-shaft got this, whatever, a couple thousandths between this plate, which is the, the outside of the motor, and the E-shaft. So that, that shows you clear as day, Jesus. We should see over a thousand and a half. Uh, each line on there is a half a thousandth. So there's a little over a thousand. Shit, it's a little tight. Yeah, off camera, we confirmed that this motor is about to seize up when it's all together. So that is the first time I've gotten to experience that, but this is also the first time we've been building a really used motor out of our uh, experience. And you can kind of see what I was being set up for that by the height of this and the height of this. Those two are very, very much the same. If not, this one's smaller, which means now you're gonna just crush these bearings. So it just started binding up. Now I wanna show you side by side. This is the FD setup. Much, much larger, much tastier bearings. The reason I brought this out is because I was actually just gonna grab this spacer and found out it's not gonna work. We can try swapping over to the FD setup here and hope that this spacer, this spacer's a C, works. So let's, let's hope. Yeah, so, who versus that, look at that. And the motor always uses these, that's the wild part. This, this is not a random part of the motor. This is a very important part. Anytime you push the clutch, you're technically pushing against those. So here's where it gets scary for me, is we do know that we're not gonna use these pieces anymore. And I have this one here, that'll go down like that. Is that gonna bind up in this bearing? I don't think so. So then, this one in there, use this bearing, this setup. Can I use this piece? Okay, let's just see if it, okay. That's looking good. And then this is looking way more promising. Of course, torque changes everything. But wow, those are so dinky in comparison. Do I have to change? Yep. I'm gonna take away my counter. That looks cool, whatever, it's slightly different. Ugh, shit. I'm not gonna just randomly run a different, maybe I will. We can, get, we can get a larger spacer, but it's really wild to see how much beefier this setup is. I'm doing what you think I'm doing. We'll just look, we're just gonna look. One, two, four, four. What? One, two, four, six? That's pretty close. Yeah. I can't believe I'm actually considering this. Here's the real trick. Let's see if they're balanced, in this, if they like both basically hold their weight in the same spot. Cause that's really the last issue. Okay, why am I, I'm actually, I'm actually gonna do this. How is this working? If one had more weight like this, you'd be sitting weight off. Do I think it's a perfect match? Yeah, I do. <laughs> this is not good. I'm going to be punished for what I'm about to do. Hopefully we get stopped by needing a different size spacer. I'll be blown away if this uh, is actually, if that spacer happens to work with this setup. We're looking for that click. That woot woot. <laughs> we still don't. I want to upgrade to this, but we can, well, at least we know that we're going to need larger than a C size spacer. 
I am very excited that we were bouncing around trying different ideas because it really, oh, thank you. It really shows you the opposite ends of the spectrum. The small stuff from the FC and the big stuff from the FD. We ended up picking up one of the second largest spacers. I didn't go with the largest because I didn't want to just go all out. I assume this will give me about two thousandths of space. But on top of that, there is a mid-level thing I wanted to try and that is this little guy right here. So this is a competition slash race bearing for an FC. And the reason I want to do that is those little rollers are much larger than what comes on at stock. When you're on the clutch, back and forth, the RPM, I figured, you know what, let's might as well upgrade this while we're at it. Now, the one thing about that is that can change the size of this. And in fact, it could go either way. It could actually, they could be smaller. But we're gonna go ahead and set up this assembly and see if we can finally get a decent in play number with the stuff we've got. One of the things that we all just were looking at last night while filming and between time is this thing is clearly worn. I can speculate, I haven't, I haven't torn apart enough motors to tell, but it just looks worn in the sense of a little too much on both sides, which would suggest the engine was tighter than we wanted to begin with. This is the side that kind of made me wonder even more, is that that bearing was riding on there a lot. Now, when you press the clutch, you're pushing the whole block this way, and this side would have gotten the brunt of that. But it just seems like the engine was a little too tight to begin with. When we <laughs> did our stuff, it uh, got even tighter. 8.02. So then I want to take that. This is 8.1. What does that mean? Well, we're actually going to switch it over to inches because that's how we measure the end plate to begin with. We're going to take this one. I don't care what that number is. Set it to zero. Go back to this one and it adds another three thousandths, which is exactly what I'm looking for. I wanted three thousandths more end play, a little bit more slop between the two bearings. So let's see if that was enough. Uh, throwing in the new bearings as well, so it could switch it all up. So it feels a little bit more promising. I can feel that the lip of this is a little higher than that. We will see when we crush it down. It's kind of neat because this is the first time we've ever actually had to deal with what if in play isn't already good. Let's hear, hopefully, a little click. Okay, that is a good sign. That is very, very good. Let's see if that combination almost went too loose. That's looking really good. I got what I wanted. That's just shy of three thousandths. Now that passed beautifully. And I tightened the front nut even more and it passed even more. <laughs> we are ready for the oil pump. Get that on there. I think we should clean this up a little bit before we... Yeah, maybe. Yeah. If that cleaned up, we're good there. Now here's, again, a twist. It's a twist. We're putting this and this in there, like that. So that little guy's inside of that. We do have a copper ring on here, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna give this a little bit of juice. Technically this affects the torque rating. Enough for me to justify going even harder on torque. <laughs> inside of that, and that would go. But I almost forgot, I can't do that yet because there's keyway. no no keyway, no front cover. I get so excited on certain things. And when you're not sure, you want to get it in this channel if it lets me go in there. Kind of do this, twist each one. We are using an RX-8 front cover gasket, the metal one, partially because of this. This is where the oil comes out. Oil pumps, goes through this channel, is blocked, comes out of here. And so we do not need it leaking back into the front. This is spinning, that's for the oil metering pump. We're not gonna be using that. It's just spinning inside of there. RX-8 makes it look super modern, just being the oldest engine we've built. This front cover does not have a front bearing like the aftermarket ones do, so this isn't too mission critical. That is... okay. That's good. So this guy goes on. Listen to this.
nice and consistent. Okay, rear counterweight. This one was really difficult. And it's gonna be just as difficult to get back in. We're going to full power for this. Okay, so this is 100 foot pounds. Okay, so we're above 100. Okay, so we're above, we want to be above 150. Again, on the three rotors and four rotors, you're doing 250. <laughs> when I say you, I, <laughs> I'm doing 250. But you have tapers on that end, and this one you don't. God, I love this thing. So we are currently at 300. I'm gonna back it down to 250. I'm gonna back it down to 200. Okay. 250. Okay, and then we're gonna go to 300. One, two. Uh. Okay, so we are over 300 foot pounds. Man, that is a lot of torque. Our pilot bearing looks good. We'll put some new grease on it. So we now have a baby short block all together, but it's time to put on that oil pan brace. That's kind of one of the most exciting parts for me. I've been waiting for this for like two days now, dude. Yeah. So I already started prepping the surface of this. So we ended up getting the racing beat flange for the oil pan. And the reason why is this motor, when you take a hard right turn, the oil splashes up against this side of the pan, you know, the pan's curved like this, and goes all the way up into this whole side of the motor, particularly deep up into here and deep in there, and it will starve this of oil. So you get air, and air is not a good lubricant. <laughs> this little pan, which is really just a thin piece of sheet metal, all it's doing is actually protecting you from just that. Okay, yeah, they thought ahead. Okay. Yeah, so, whew, I was like, there's no way they would design it that way. So it does allow oil from the regulator, is spraying oil out right under here. The regulator oil then pours down into here, but when the car turns, it hits here, so it stays in the oil system. These are all the bearings, the front bearing, the, the rear bearing, and this chain is actually getting oiled from a really small hole in the E-shaft. All of that oil can pour down. And of course, if it overpressurizes, it pours down there too. We're gonna goop this up like crazy. The only downside that I see about this pan brace is that we have to do the oil pan twice. It's such a small oil pan. For, think about how much space there is over on that side. I, I can see why people had uh, that sort of problem. I do expect to have to do something over down here. So we are gonna use all new hardware. That's not just because we want it to look good, that's actually because we can't find the old ones. These like uh, five cents a piece or something, they're super inexpensive. <laughs> Back to this moment, I'm very proud of that. Thought that this is where it was gonna end, but this is where it begins. So we got that back on. Whenever you're pushing the clutch in, the pilot bearing actually starts spinning. When the clutch is out, the pilot bearing doesn't spin, but I seized my car pushing the clutch in and then it actually welds the transmission to the engine. And it's horrible. Just a drop. A little bit more than a drop. Assembly there. Yep, there we go. Okay, line it. And we're gonna pick this thing up and drop it back in. 